Amen. Uh, I am sure you have times in your life where you uh, set out to do something um, in your day. You've got a list of things to do, and maybe one of those things is most important, and you find yourself at the end of the day missing like the most important thing. You did all the other things, right? I've told you about my treks into grocery stores for that one thing, and you go and you get all the other things, and you leave and you go, oh, I forgot the milk. That happens to me all the time. Um, sometimes I procrastinate if I have like one timely deadline. I do everything else except that. My office is suddenly cleaned. I've decided to clean the refrigerator. Uh, I've taken out the trash. I suddenly want to exercise. All, but I've missed the one thing that I need to do that's the most important. And sometimes that's what we do in life, isn't it? Am I the only one? Fathers on Father's Day, right? You missed that one thing. Honey says, your wife says, hey, honey, I'm leaving for, can you just make sure you do this one thing? You come back, you did everything else. The gutters are clean, but the garbage is still sitting there. Oh, yeah, yeah. As we're talking, uh, over the last few weeks about the church and what does it mean to be a church and why do we do what we do. Um, in many ways, this message today is the core of what it is we should be doing as a church. Uh, today's focus is going to be on discipleship. Discipleship, that's not a Christian cruise line. But in fact, it's the main calling of the church in Matthew 28, these are Jesus' final words before he ascends. It says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make what? Disciples. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you. How long? always, even to the end of the age. And we have referenced this verse many times in our church. And we have talked often about how the main term for a Christian in scripture in the New Testament is actually not Christian. There's only two usages of the word Christian, but the main word for who we are is disciple. Who we are and what we do is we're disciples, which is the Greek word for student or learner. A good word in our uh, language today would be an apprentice. Right, an apprentice, someone that is an apprentice is someone that is learning from someone else how to do certain things. And so this verse, Jesus sends out his disciples then and disciples now. And he says that once someone gets baptized, then I want you to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And that's really a good definition of what it means to be a disciple, to learn what Jesus taught and then to do what Jesus taught. This verse is called the Great Commission. Some polls have shown that many churchgoers, a, a, a scary high percentage of churchgoers, if you ask them what is the Great Commission, they don't know. They know what the greatest commandment is, but the Great Commission often is that one thing that gets left undone. We've got a lot of other things that we need to do, good and important things, but this is the thing that Jesus said, hey, family, I'm leaving. I need you to do this while I'm gone. And so this word apprentice really speaks well of what it means to be a disciple. Um, in our language today, we often hear about being an apprentice uh, in the realm of trade, right? You will be a plumber or an electrician or a teacher. You first become a, an apprentice. And what an apprentice does is they learn from someone that is a professional or a master at that trade. And they don't just sit in the classroom, do they? Where do they go? They go out on the job and they're learning through real life experience how to be a plumber or an electrician or a teacher. And so to be an apprentice requires time, training, questions, and experience. Apprenticeship is not just a classroom lecture. It's on the job training with a seasoned mentor. It's, it's what I'll call this morning embodied learning where you're seeing how something is done and not just hearing how something is done, where the textbook comes alive, right? If you want to be a plumber, there are codes and manuals to read, but when you're an apprentice, the textbook comes alive. You're having embodied learning, and in Jesus, Scripture says that Jesus is the Word made flesh, he is the embodiment of what it means to live this way. And so as disciples of Jesus, we are embodying him to others. And so uh, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to spend the first part of our sermon this morning 
looking at Jesus and his dealing with his disciples, and then we'll find ourselves in the story for the second half, okay? So Mark chapter one, we'll get there in a second. The pattern of biblical discipleship is like this. Jesus does something, say that. Jesus does something. The disciples watch or listen, you say that. And then the disciples do it. Jesus does something, the disciples watch and listen, and then they do it. And that's what it means to be a disciple. They spend time with Jesus, they listen to him, they watched him, and then he would say, okay, it's your turn. You go do it now. The disciples made all sorts of mistakes. The gospels are not written showing us a perfect people. The disciples ask really what we would call dumb questions sometimes. And by dumb, I mean the questions you would ask and the questions I would ask too. What's that all about? Why'd you say this? Jesus, can we go kill those people? I mean, that's, those are questions that you find in the Bible. That's absurd. It's not a bunch of people with halos walking around like this going, thou shalt thus this ifish. Real people watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, and then following what Jesus said. Let's start in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. And here's what he said. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. First thing Jesus does on the scene is he starts preaching. And he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon. They were casting a net in the sea, for they were what? Fisher. Fishermen. Fishermen catch fish. Good, you're doing great. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Verse 18. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. So the first disciples that Jesus calls were fishermen. They were fishermen by trade. They were fishermen by family. We're meeting these four brothers, these four men who spent their days catching fish. And it seems that for these four men, from probably a young age, they learned how to fish. They learned the, the technique. They learned the timing. They learned how to fix the equipment. Here we saw that they're mending the nets. The nets would break. They would get caught on a rock or other debris, and they would have to fix it so they could throw the net out so they could catch what? Fish. And so these four men were people who had become accustomed to learning through apprenticeship. Their father was a fisherman. Probably their father before him was a fisherman. And so they were learning how to be fishermen. And so Jesus says, gentlemen, I want to invite you to something that not everybody got to be invited to at the time. I want you to follow me and be my apprentices, not as fish or in carpentry, but I am a rabbi and I am going to teach and show the way of God. And I want you to follow me and learn that trait. He says, you know how to fish. I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. And notice he doesn't say on this first day, you are fishers of men. I'm going to show you how to become fishers of men, he says. So seizing this opportunity, they follow Jesus. Verse, eight, verse 21, so now these men are following him. He went on into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and began to do what? Teach. And they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as scribes. And just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed. And so they debated among themselves, What is this? A new teaching with authority. And he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. 
on day one of, of apprenticeship, these brothers are with Jesus in the synagogue. He's teaching them. The people in the synagogue who would have gathered every Sabbath day to hear God's word read and explained, hear something new and fresh. And it wasn't because Jesus had like three good points and a funny joke at the end. But he was teaching with authority. He was bringing life to God's word with power. And in the midst of the sermon, in the midst of the conversation, someone that had been tormented with a demon reveals himself, starts freaking out in the meeting. Jesus deals with this, delivers this man from his bondage. The man is free and the demon flees. I mean, what happened at church for you today? Wow. And so not only are they hearing the authority of Jesus, they're seeing the authority of Jesus. You know, I'm sure the well-meaning rabbis of the day, when someone was tormented with an evil spirit, I'm sure they prayed. Maybe they said, hey, go read this portion of the Torah. And maybe they said, you know what, don't come during the service. Maybe you come after the service and we can pray for you. You think about how many people were left in bondage and, and tormented until Jesus showed up. The news around him, around the community spread, verse 29. Immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. He came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her. And as all good Jewish mothers, then she waits on them and makes sure they have something to eat. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out a few demons, many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place, and he was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him, and he said, and, and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Verse 38. He said to him, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby, that I may preach there also, for this is what I came for. And he went to the synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Preaching and casting out demons. Go to chapter 2. And so in just this quick cross-section of the life of Jesus. We see him teaching. We see him healing. We see him backing down the devil. We see him at someone's house, right? Peter's mother-in-law. He heals her from this fever. They're eating together. They're spending time together. The disciples are doing nothing. They're not doing anything. They're watching and listening. Who's doing everything? Jesus the teacher, the rabbi, he's doing everything. And a good student is sitting there watching and listening. In chapter two, verse 13, and he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth and said to him, follow me. And he got up and did what? followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at the table in his house, that many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? So this is the moment. It's time. For, it's, it's, it's a pop quiz. Right? Notice here Jesus is, is dining and having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. So it wasn't all just like, okay, guys, it's time for class. Everybody sit down and get out your notebooks. They're living life together. They're enjoying life together. They're eating and drinking together. In John, we read that Jesus went to a wedding. Right? And Jewish weddings of this time, you know what they probably included? What did they probably include? Come on. Dancing. Dancing. Wow, that took longer than it should have, man. <laughs> Jesus was probably dancing and they're drinking and they're eating and enjoying life together. And now it's time for the disciples to answer a question. 
Why is your master eating and drinking and doing it with these people? And verse 17, hearing this, Peter, Simon, uh, James, John, no, who? Jesus said to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's still not time for the students to do anything. They're asked a question. The teacher says, hold on a second. I'll take that one. In the next chapter, we read this beautiful verse, Mark 3, 13 through 15. Jesus went on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed of all the crowds, of all the followers, he appointed how many? Twelve. And here's what he wanted from these twelve. First, so that they would be with him. I love that verse. Jesus called the people that he wanted. And the first task of a disciple was that they would be with him. And that he could send them out to do what? To preach and to have authority to cast out demons. And so in this verse, Jesus is defining the relationship he wants to have with these men. He wants to be with them. And then he's going to send them out to preach. And in Mark chapter 6, that's what we see happen. Flip to Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus went out from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples, what did they do? Followed him. Jump down to verse 6. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the 12, and look at this. He began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Verse 12. They, the disciples, went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. So now it's not until chapter 6, Jesus has taught, he's healed, he's preached, he's dealt with demons, he's showing them, the disciples, what he does and Why he does what he does, he's spending time with them and in formal teaching settings, he's living life with them, he's walking with them, he's talking to them about bushes, he's talking to them about crops, he's talking to them about the cloud formations, he's with them, he's talking to them, he's teaching them. And now in chapter 6, he calls these 12 together, look at me, he calls these 12 together and he says, all right guys, I want you to go out and do it. And then when we get to this verse here, they come back and they say, We did it. We did it. We went out. We did it. Right now. Did they take over the whole world? No, but they went to their little villages and they saw God at work in their lives. Oh, man. Jesus must have been so proud of them. Verse 31. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. And there were many people coming and going. They didn't have time to eat. And they went away to the boat to a secluded place by themselves. Isn't that beautiful? Discipleship is Jesus does something, the disciples watch and listen, and then the disciples do it. Discipleship is being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. That's what it is. That's what it means to be a disciple. Be with Jesus. And as you be with Jesus, you become like Jesus. And then from there, you go out and do what Jesus did. Let's say this together. Discipleship is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and then to do what Jesus did. That's what it means to be a disciple. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple of Jesus. And your day should be filled with you spending time with Jesus in your mind and in your thoughts and with your Bible open, considering him, putting yourselves in the in the stories we're reading in the Gospels and watching him and thinking about him and looking for him and observing his relationship with God. And then as we do that, you become more like Jesus. And then in your life, you start to do what Jesus did. If you've been following Christ for for a long time or a short time, you should see yourself, you should see Jesus in yourself more. Amen? And so now, as we make the turn here, to disciple someone else 
is to help someone else spend time with Jesus to then become like Jesus and to do what Jesus did. That's what it means to make disciples. Jesus did that with his followers. And for the Christian following the Great Commission, what the church should be about is those that are disciples spending time with other people, helping them spend time with Jesus to become like Jesus so they can do what Jesus did. So they can do what Jesus did themselves. And so there should be times in our week as Christians where we pray. Do you agree? It's important. There should be times in our days and in our weeks where we read the Bible. Do you agree? There should be times in our day and our week when we are fellowshipping with other Christians. Do you agree? We should sing together, right? Maybe we'll do a sermon on dancing. Or maybe I should take a class first and then... In all of that, we should also have time in our day and in our week where we are discipling someone and, and also where someone is discipling us. Now, I know every day you try hard to pray. I know every day you're endeavoring to be faithful to read the Bible and maybe you sing and you praise and you're trying to get better at fellowship and being with other Christians. But I don't know if we are as committed to this important call of discipleship as we are to those other things. But this is what it means to be a disciple, that we would devote time to be discipled and to disciple someone else. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, it means setting aside time randomly and intentionally with someone else to do what disciples do, to read the Bible, to pray, to talk about life, to read a book, to do a study, to do life together as you go, and to have good conversations, which include Good questions. You and I should spend time in our weeks with another Christian, preferably one that is, has been following Christ longer or that we look at their lives and say, that person probably could help me. You spend time with them and you come and you say, oh, Mona, I got a question for you. All week, I've been wondering, what are you supposed to do when you're driving and people cut you off, I'm a new Christian and I'm sure you figured out how to deal with traffic. What do you do? How do you deal with that? And Mona said, talk to somebody else. <laughs> do you have someone that you can ask those questions to? Do you have someone that you can say, hey, I'm struggling in my marriage. It's not a crisis. We're not about to get divorced. I don't need to sign up for, you know, intensive therapy and go away for three weeks. We're not there yet. But I'm trying to figure out how to be a good husband or be a good wife now that I have children. Maureen. You and Andy have been married longer than Jess and I, and you've raised a son who's older than us. Can you talk to me about how as a Christian you've done that? Do you have someone that you can ask that question to? Are you being asked that question? This should color our lives. Being disciples and making other disciples is what we should be doing as a church and as Christians. Being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. Now, uh, I am sure that in this room, there are people who feel hesitant to do that because you don't feel qualified because you make mistakes. Anyone here ever make mistakes? Okay. A couple people didn't raise their hand. There you go. That's your first one. Maybe you feel like, well, I'm not a pastor. Or, or I'm not an elder. I'm not a fellowship coordinator. Or, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never read Habakkuk. And so I'm not someone that should be discipling someone else. And I think that that sort of mentality is exactly what the devil would like us all to think. 
Because last time I checked, the perfect one who didn't make any mistakes is the one we're trying to lead ourselves to with each other's help. The goal isn't becoming my disciple or Mona's or Maureen's. The goal is being a disciple of Jesus. And so we need people in our lives who aren't perfect, but who are following Jesus and who can help me to do that. So if your hesitancy to initiate your time in your life with someone else is the mistakes in your life, you don't realize that your mistakes may be what qualify you. Because a lot of the questions that a young disciple is going to ask you is, what do you do when you make a mistake? And guess what? I'm looking at a bunch of qualified people who can answer that question. <laughs> I'm going to read some verses to you that probably you are hesitant to embrace and obey. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. We read that verse where Paul is saying, imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. And you all are thinking, well, that's Paul. Next verse, Philippians 3, 17, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Well, yeah, that's Paul and maybe Timothy. But both of those verses are actually de describing discipleship. As a Christian, you and I should be able to say to the people that we're discipling, follow me as I'm following Christ. Now, if you say it like this, follow me, you're disqualified. But friends, is your life about the Lord? Do, do you love God? Do you want to follow Christ, right? Is that the life you're striving for? Yes. Is it the life you're striving for? Yes. yes, it is. I hope it is. I believe it is. I, I know it is. Well, then you should be living a life that people could look at and say, that's how you do it. We're not talking perfection. We're not talking about not making mistakes. We're not talking about, you know, that show you watched on Netflix that one time or anything like that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this is what it means to be a Christian. You're following Jesus and you can bring someone along, someone along in whatever level you're in and say, this is how I'm doing it, my best. These verses are verses that we're like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. But these are the very verses that our, our church should be modeled after. That we have a church that says, yes, you can spend time with Rose if you want to know what it's like to be a Christian woman. Yes, you can spend time with Christine. You should. That's exactly who you should be spending time with. Who should you be spending time with instead of these wonderful people? The world? Yourself? But that's what we're doing instead. Because we're hesitant to say, yeah, I'm not doing it perfectly and there's so many areas I need to grow in but let's follow Christ together. You and I together are going to be with Jesus. We're going to learn from Jesus, and then we're going to give it a shot and take it out for a ride doing what Jesus did. Hebrews 13 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. That's what it means to be a disciple and a disciple maker to have people in your life that you are investing in to help and you're initiating and you're asking and talking and having conversation with and that you're doing that with someone else. Remember those who led you, spoke the word of God to you and learn from those and follow their example. And so the question for us to uh, leave with today is this. Why is this one-on-one, life-on-life, intentional uh, practice of discipleship not happening in our church or in your life as often as it should? There was a survey uh, done of, of uh, practicing Christians in America, and uh, more than one-third of the people surveyed said that spiritual growth is important and that the way that I do it is by myself. So why isn't this happening in our church? Why isn't this happening in our life? I think that the biggest threat to us discipling others and being discipled ourselves 
There might be a bunch, but here's what I feel the biggest one is. Time. 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 We're busy. Right? Our, our schedules are full. Time. The biggest threat to discipleship, I think, is time. Yes, there's issues of the heart. Yes, there's issues of the devil trying to stop us. But I, but I really think that if, if we believe that this is something Jesus wants from us and wants from you, then we would say, this is something I should devote time to. And it, if, if I'm saying, hey, as a church, let's begin today to intentionally spend time with other people and, and disciple them. Find someone in this church in your life and say, hey, I'd like to spend some time with you to help you follow Jesus. Hey, I need to spend some time with you so you can help me follow Jesus. If you would do that today, and, and if, you're, if you're hearing that call this morning, and you're feeling like, oh man, that's just another thing I have to do and I don't really have time for that. If that's how you're feeling about what we're talking about this morning, then that's an indication, as it is in my life, that my life is full of things secondary to what Jesus wants me to actually spend my time doing. Does that make sense? Like if, if thinking about spending time with someone to disciple them, taking the time to spend time with another believer, spending time in the word, spending time to pray consistently over a long period of time seems like that's a big endeavor, then our priorities need to be reassessed because that's what we, that should be on the list up pretty high. Discipleship is, is a long-term investment. Someone once said that discipleship is crock pot cooking, not microwave. Just, it's, it's a slow cooker, right? We're a bunch of slow, we need slow cooking. We're not, we're not quick, right? It takes time. It takes meeting with someone every Tuesday morning for a couple years, maybe. That's what Jesus did. He spent time with these men for a couple years. And then, and then they were kind of ready to go at it alone. Time is the biggest challenge that we're facing. There's a man in Newport. Uh, Richard, I don't remember this guy's name. But there's, there's, a, there's a man in Newport, and maybe he doesn't even work there anymore, who works in the engineering department. And uh, when you go to Newport and you want to find out about how a c city street was laid out or where the water is or, or, or whatever happened to that building, you go talk to this guy. Let's say his name is Bob. You go to Bob and Bob knows everything. Bob knows everything. You say, hey, I'm doing a job. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, where my utilities are on Main Street. And he goes, oh, yeah. You know, he doesn't have anything in front of him. It's all in his head. He goes, yeah, you know, in 1984, there was a pothole over there. And that pothole got filled by, what was that guy's name? Oh, yeah, Joey Bag of Donuts. And Joey Bag of Donuts filled up the hole. And when he was walking home, he saw another pothole and realized that's where your water is. <laughs> this guy knows everything. It's all in his head. He knows everything about the city of Newport that you would ever want to know. And I realize that if you need information about the city of Newport, you go see Bob. But here's the problem. All of the information about the city of Newport is in Bob's head. And when Bob retires or dies, nobody's going to know anything. I'm dead serious. Nobody's going to know anything. Protect Bob at all costs. He's a national treasure. When Bob goes, everything that he knows is gone. And when, when you go, everything that you know is gone. And here's the problem about Bob and about us. It is much easier for Bob to just do everything. It would take a long time for someone to sit with Bob and to write the things down. It would take a long time to find the file that Bob has in his head and make a copy of it so the next generation has it. And so you know what? Nobody's going to do that because it takes longer to spend time with someone to teach them than just do it yourself.
And so it's easier to just follow Jesus on your own than spend time with someone who it's going to take some time to teach them that isn't going to get it right right away. And we have that option. We can be a church that just goes at it alone and complains about the next generation of Christians, how they don't do it like we did it, and they don't know about service, and they don't work hard, and they don't know the Bible like we used to, and what's the deal with their hands being raised, and why are they always acting like this, and why do they always sing these kind of songs? We used to sing these kind of songs, and you can, you can keep this mature, good version of Christianity that we all have right now and just hold on to it because it's hard and it takes time to disciple someone. And that's the kind of church we can be. Or we can be a Christian church which says, no, I'm going to do the hard work that takes time to invest in someone else. Because that's what Jesus wants, and that's what happened to me. Somebody took the time to spend with me so that I could be where I am today. That's what Jesus wants. That's what Jesus wants. So today, before uh, you leave today with that card, I want you to uh, answer two questions. And if you don't have uh, the answer to those questions today, there it is. These are the two questions that I want you to set out to have answered in a reasonable amount of time. Answers to these two questions. One, I am being discipled by blank. And then number two, I am discipling blank. And if if you can answer those questions now, praise God. And if, if you can't, then I want you to write down those two sentences and I want you to pray this week about whose names are going to be put on there. I am being discipled by blank and I am discipling blank. Because as disciples of Jesus, I think we all should have names filled in those lines. I am being discipled by blank, and I am discipling blank. All right, let's pray as we consider these things this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we put before you our own lives as followers of Jesus. And we ask that you would help us to step out of uh, maybe our comfort zone or uh, our busyness, our selfishness, Lord, and, and take a step to join you in this great work today. Help us to be discipled and be around the people that, that can help us connect with you and your son. And I pray, God, that you would uh, help us to take initiative to get involved and disciple somebody else. Pray that you'd show us, Lord, what we should be doing with our time and who we should be spending our time with. And, and that you would show us along the way how to, how to do this, God, how to, how to do this. I pray, Lord, that the, the men and women of, of this congregation, Lord, could could be disciples of of Christ and that we could credit not just you and your goodness and your power and your word, but we could credit each other in that progress. Please, Lord. And I pray, God, that through all this, uh, you would receive the glory and that would be more like Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.